This is a special presentation from Alabama News Network. Making History Today, brought to you by Alpha Insurance. Hello, I'm Jerome Jones. Welcome to our Alabama News Network special that we call Making History Today. We're celebrating Black History Month with local stories we think that you'd like to see. Here's what's coming up. We have a lot for you to watch, including back in 1965. What were the consequences for people helping those on the Selma to Montgomery March? We, found out, we find out from the family that offered their property as a campsite. Also, Jimmy Lee Jackson's death helped spark those civil rights marches. A nurse in Selma will tell you what it was to treat his injuries the night he was shot. Plus, have you ever heard of the Peacock Trace community in Montgomery? If not, then the interstate highway system may be to blame. That's all coming up on Making History Today. First, we're sharing the stories of people in Montgomery whose lives were directly touched by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. One is a church pastor who had his first encounter with Dr. King when he was just a boy. But that's not the only time Dr. King played a pivotal role in his life. Here's Alabama News Network reporter Kay McCabe with his story. When Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came to Montgomery in 1954, I think I may have been about nine years old, and I saw a very impressionable young preacher who had come to our congregation and I would sit and listen to him week after week. Montgomery native and now pastor at the Lily Baptist Church, the Reverend Thomas E. Jordan says as a young boy, he knew he always wanted to make an impact on his community. After witnessing and later being baptized by the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he knew he'd want to serve in the church. I was baptized in 1956. I believe I was about 11 years old. Dr. King was 26. Dr. King baptized Jordan in the height of the modern civil rights movement in which Jordan describes being a young boy who sought out change. We respected at that time the signs that said white and colored. And we knew that we went downtown to the stores that there was colored drinking water. That was a color, colored eating counter. Jordan was later ordained as a minister by both Dr. King and Dr. Ralph D. Abernathy in 1966 and says he struggled with the decision to come back and preach in his hometown. But it was the strength and wisdom from the two that inspired him to return and make a change. It's all right to celebrate history. It's all, all right to celebrate words, but we have to transform this into action. The Reverend says with all he's been through and seen over the years in Montgomery, he's proud of the black community and wants to continue to inspire and make a change. I think as a young minister and having um, uh, the philosophy of social justice mixed in with uh, the Christian religion, as was the case with Dr. King, all of this had a great effect upon uh, my ministry here in Montgomery. And as Dr. King touched the heart of that church pastor, another man got to touch Dr. King after becoming his personal barber. That was back in the 1950s when Dr. King still lived here. So what was it like to get to know Dr. King personally long before he became a national leader? I got the chance to meet the man who you may say groomed the movement. 60 years ago, bigotry and hate had stained the city of Montgomery. The city was segregated. There were very few places for black citizens to shop, eat, or sleep. But one neighborhood, Centennial Hill, was the place to be if you were black. That's where all the black uh, bourgeoisie live. On High Street was a grocery store, a doctor's office, and restaurants, all catering to black citizens. But the biggest building in the neighborhood, the Ben Moore Hotel, was a fixture in the community. You had their lodging, you had their alcohol and then you also had the food service within the same same building it was on the facilities at that time for for blacks it was in this building that nelson malden and his brother would open malden brothers barbershop and it was here where nelson and a young preacher from atlanta georgia first met and i saw the blue pontiac pull up in front of the shop and i figured by he must have been a customer coming to get a haircut I looked at his head, I said, oh, heck, I can knock him out in 15 minutes. The man in that blue Pontiac would change the world. I asked him, what was your name? He said, Martin Luther King. I said, where are you from? He said, Lana, Georgia. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm here to preach my trial. So I said, oh, good to meet you. It was 1954 when Nelson first met Dr. King. At the time, Nelson was still a student at Alabama State University, and King was just a rookie preacher taking his first assignment to pastor a church. But over the next eight years, which started as a haircut, 
would develop into a friendship. In the barbershop, they already refer to it as the Black Man Country Club. So we talk about something and everything. You talk about religion, you talk about politics, sometimes you talk about sex. The barbershop was a place of refuge, a place where fathers took their sons and people left feeling empowered and enlightened. Dr. King and his family lived at 309 South Jackson Street. Countless times Dr. King walked this path from his house to Nelson's barbershop. He'd come down to the barbershop and do a little writing and sometimes do a little reading. And he had, we had a little crash can, he threw some of those notes that he was writing in the crash can. And I said, if I could have saved some of those notes, I probably could have bought everybody in Montgomery a Porsche. As the Montgomery bus boycott gained steam and the civil rights movement grew, Dr. King became a prominent figure for human rights in the United States. Another factor he had made Reverend King was the negative force. Reverend King represented the positive force. By this time, Dr. King was so recognizable that he traveled with security. Nelson says they believe the security was provided by the Lyndon B. Johnson administration. But after delivering a speech denouncing the Vietnam War on April 4, 1967, Dr. King's security disappeared. My brother asked him, where is your security now? We never discussed security with him. That's when he took his finger and said, the man who stands with me now. And that was the very last word I heard him say. Then he went to Memphis, Tennessee. Four months later, you know what happened to him. Exactly one year after his speech in New York City, Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4, 1968. After his death, the Civil Rights Act would become law and integration began. But the Centennial Hill community was falling into disrepair and black-owned businesses struggled to keep up with their corporate competition. Reverend King said, you better be careful what you ask for, you might get it. So we asked for public, we asked for integration, but we had no idea the impact it would have on black business. Over the years, Nelson had compiled dozens of pictures of Dr. King and other prominent figures from the movement that were customers of the barber shop. In 2019, Nelson donated some of these priceless relics to the Smithsonian Institute. I gave 16 items to the Smithsonian. The Ben Moore Hotel is now a shuttered eyesore on Centennial Hill, and people are still fighting for social equality and civil rights. I don't question the whole country made progress, but I think he'd be very disturbed to see what's going on in Washington right now. And those items that Nelson Malden gave to the Smithsonian Institute now have their own display at the National Museum of African American History. Throughout this special, we want to share a special Making History Today vignettes. These are short segments with people who are making an impact in our community in extraordinary ways. Take a look at what some of your neighbors are doing to shape Montgomery for the future. My name is Anthony Brock. I am the founder and head of School of Valiant Cross Academy in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, we are an all-male 6th through 10th grade and eventually 6th through 12th grade school. Uh, we provide a high quality education where we're giving a lot of love and a lot of exposure to our young men. And I believe all of us are where we are because of other people not giving up on us throughout the way and pouring into us layer upon layer of love. And so I just feel an obligation to continue to give back to the young people and never give up on them, never allow them to hold their head down, giving them a good posture and a positive outlook on life. So that's just what I'm called to do. It's just natural to me. I would say without a doubt that my parents have the biggest influence on, on my life. I just know the love and the passion they have for what they're doing. And it's never a place here in Montgomery that I can't go and somebody say they know the work that my father's done or my mother's done with them. And that's really inspiring me to keep going on to create a legacy here in Montgomery. My name is Michelle Browder, and I am the founder of I Am More Than, a youth organization here in Montgomery, Alabama. And I am the owner of More Than Tours, a social business that gives tours to people that are visiting our beautiful city. I got my desire and passion to work with others from growing up in the South. One of the people that I stand on the shoulders of every day is Georgia Gilmore, and she was a woman who was very instrumental in helping to fund the civil rights movement through her culinary art skills. What keeps me motivated and is the resiliency of the women of the civil rights movement. It's the narratives of these people who, although they were faced with difficult times, they were managed to get through it. They managed to change some laws. The most important impression I would like to leave with others is that you should always speak truth to power when the opportunity presents itself. Do it respectfully and lovingly. I'm Kevin King. I'm founder and executive director of the King's Canvas Gallery and Studio. I started the King's Canvas because I wanted to provide opportunity and access for people who would be considered on the margins of society. 
I wanted to kind of be that go-between that would merge uh, a community that's forgotten about with opportunity and access that that's readily available to any other visual artist or any type of artist out there. My wife is a source of inspiration because without her uh, buying me those art supplies in 2013 and said, Kevin, you need to create, I don't believe that I would have been here where I am now telling others, you need to create. One of the most important things that I would love to leave others is understanding the God that we serve created us. He created us to create. Uh, because of that, you know, you know, we have dignity, you know, we have value, and I want people to see the value within themselves that God has put placed inside of them. What was it like to treat the man whose gunshot wounds led to his death, but also sparked the Selma to Montgomery marches? Coming up on Making History Today, a nurse who treated Jimmy Lee Jackson in Selma the night he was shot in 1965 shares her story. Also coming up, those Selma to Montgomery marchers weren't the only ones who put their lives on the line. So were the people who helped them along their journey. Meet the family who offered their property as the first campsite. Continuing coverage. The death of Jimmy Lee Jackson inspired the historic Selma to Montgomery marches of 1965. He was shot during a voting rights protest in Marion and died eight days later at Good Samaritan Hospital in Selma. We're sitting down with one of the nurses who cared for Jackson the night he was brought in. Here's Alabama News Network reporter George McDonald from Selma. 85-year-old Vera Jenkins Booker worked at Good Samaritan Hospital during the voting rights struggle of the 60s. I was the 11 to 7 supervisor for seven and a half years at the Good Samaritan Hospital, and I was there in 1965. Booker says Jimmy Lee Jackson was the only patient to come to the hospital on the night he came. She found out later he was brought in by Albert Turner Sr. I saw the blood and I pulled up his shirt, and that was a hole on the left side of his abdomen where the intestine had come out, about the, about the size of a medium grape grapefruit. She says Jackson had surgery that night and seemed well for a time, then suddenly took a turn for the worse and died after a second surgery. Booker says she helped take care of Jackson and talked with him during his time in the hospital until he died. He told me all about being in service, how he had worked, but he was working in Marion, doing all he could to get all the blacks, everybody he could, to vote. His death sparked the idea for the Selma to Montgomery march. State troopers attacked marchers during one of the march attempts, a day now known as Bloody Sunday. Booker says she was called in to work that day to help with the turmoil. You talking about chaos, chaos, chaos it was. Booker says Jimmy Lee Jackson has been in her thoughts during monumental voting rights moments, like the signing of the Voting Rights Act and the election of former President Barack Obama. I feel like his death was not in vain. Reporting from Selma, George McDonald, Alabama News Network. Good Samaritan Hospital was the only hospital in Selma for black people at that time. Good Sam, as it was called, closed in 1983. The building now sits in a state of disrepair. Time now for another group of personal vignettes as some of our community leaders tell you in their own words what they're doing to bring equality to Montgomery. My name is Henry Tellis, uh, born and raised here in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, I teach during the day. I teach government, uh, economics, and AP U.S. history at City Lanier High School. Then I leave my job at City Lanier and I continue to run my foundation, my nonprofit throughout the city to impact young people's lives. Uh, I said when I was younger, when my time came, you know, after playing the NFL and doing well in that, that I would give back to the community. So my passion and desire you know, comes from just wanting to see people around me successful. And no matter what is going on in your life, no matter what the circumstance you're dealing with that time period, is that you can overcome those things and that you have control over those things and that you don't allow circumstances to stop you from being successful in life. But I think the one thing I want people to always remember that I never gave up. And not only did I not give up, I want to encourage everybody around me now to remember where I went through that they can overcome those things too. So I said, no one thing that I want to leave is that you can do anything and that um, no one can stop you but you. My name is Cassandra Brown and I am the president of the Montgomery Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. It is my desire to always help someone 
along the way. I've been taught each one reach and bring one along. So I've just used that uh, throughout my life and that's very important to me. I consider myself as a public servant and any way that I can help my fellow man, that is what I think that I'm here for. I think that that is really my purpose in life is to help others. So I have a strong desire and passion and I just don't see that going anywhere. So that is just a part of me. The most important impression that I would like to leave is my absolute confidence in my ability to make a difference and my um, desire to never stop making a difference. We've introduced you to some important people, but there are also important places to recognize during Black History Month. Those include the campsites that were used in the Selma to Montgomery March and from Montgomery, the Peacock Trace neighborhood that you may have never heard of, but chances are you drive through it every day. See how it's being remembered in a new book. Continuing coverage. Most of you know the story of the Selma to Montgomery Civil Rights March of 1965 after Bloody Sunday. What's often forgotten are the campsites that the marchers used along the way and the dangers they faced in spending the night and the consequences landowners suffered for offering up their property. David Hall allowed hundreds of marchers to make their first stop at his farm to rest overnight once they left Selma. His family sharing their memories with us. Once again, here's Alabama News Network reporter Kay McCabe. Dr. King explained to him that you might have some problems here and I want you to know or you're asking for trouble. Dad say, I feel no man but the Lord. Susie Hall Stover, the third of eight children of David and Cheney Hall, says she remembers it all when her dad says he overheard Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. saying they needed a rest stop for the marchers and volunteered his farm. He went and told them, well, I have some property and you can stay on my property. That's the kind of person dad was. Hall Stover, who was living in Birmingham at the time, says her brothers and sisters feared what would happen to their dad, but were advised to stay away from the farm. We knew mm -hmm. about the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. We lived here. We lived in the South in Selma all our lives. He said that if they kill me, okay, but I can't let them do nothing to my children. And it was here where the foot soldiers began their march from Selma to Montgomery. They would walk about 10 miles before reaching their first campsite, the David Hall Farm. Over 300 marchers arrived at the farm the night of March 21st, 1965. They would rest and as many know would continue marching throughout the next couple days until reaching the Capitol steps in Montgomery. But for Hall and his farm, the backlash had just begun. He did pay a price because he couldn't do anything. He couldn't go and get nothing. Everything was froze. Banks wouldn't let him have no funds or nothing. So he had to give up the farm. Hall Stover says despite all of the aftermath her dad saw, he always told her he knew he did what was right. So he knew that it comes a time that you need to stand up for the right thing. My dad used to tell us, you don't scratch if you don't itch, and you don't laugh if you're not tickled. So you stand up for the right thing, and you do the right thing, and you help somebody along the way. David Hall passed away in 1972, but his family says they're working hard to continue his legacy and bring light to this forgotten part of history. The Selma to Montgomery March lasted four days, and by the time they reached the capital city, there were tens of thousands of people downtown. While there's a renewed interest in Alabama's civil rights history, one historic home is seemingly forgotten. It sits vacant on a two-lane highway in Perry County. It's the family home of Coretta Scott, the wife of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The two were married in the home in 1953, but there's no sign or historic marker. The home is in disrepair and isn't open to visitors. Tax records show it remains in the King family and not much has ever been done with it. While we're talking about important places of the civil rights movement, a new book takes a closer look at one of Montgomery's historic churches and the once thriving community it served and continues to serve. Mount Zion AME Zion Church 
is where the Montgomery Improvement Association held its first meeting. It's also where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was elected to be the face of the civil rights movement. But less is said about the community where the church is located, which is in the shadows of the I-65, I-85 interchange. A Montgomery man is changing that with his new book. Here's more on how the new book brings new light to this important place in history. I-85 came from this way, I-65 came from that way, and this was obliterated. C.P. Everett IV reminisces on his West Montgomery childhood home in the neighborhood once called Peacock Trace. The neighborhood is home to the historic Mount Zion AME Zion Church, a place widely known as the meeting spot that started the Montgomery bus boycott. Over the years, Mount Zion pastors have been known as giants in the civil rights movement. As you can't talk about just one pastor. They've been in the leadership in the forefront for a very, very long time. Peacock Trace was a prominent black community, but the construction of the I-85, I-65 interchange decimated the community, and the church eventually relocated to what is now Fred Gray Avenue. When the, those, those highway systems were put in place, it caused what we, what I have named the Montgomery diaspora. The, the members of Mount Zion who were in walking distance were then scattered all over this city. Everett's book celebrates the church's journey and leadership from 1866 to 1956. The book also traces the evolution of the Peacock Trace community from a 100-acre plantation to a civil rights beacon. West Montgomery, a place that was once a slave plantation, a place of enslavement, which has become the birthplace of the leadership of the modern civil rights movement. Uh, this booklet, uh, it's certainly going to help our school systems. Uh, it's going to help America. The church is in the process of restoring the historic original church to be developed into a museum. A volume two of the book is also in the works. And that part of Montgomery is still feeling the effects of the interstate system today. Many claim that the area was chosen as a way to force black leaders out of their homes and shut down two prominent churches in the community, one of those being Mount Zion AME Zion Church. That book cost $35 and all of the proceeds go towards restoring the original building and supporting the church's mission. Books can be purchased online with GiveLify or Cash App. Just search Mount Zion AME Zion Church and message the word book. For the final time, we have gotten another group of community leaders who use their expertise and life experiences to improve life in Montgomery. Here they are now sharing what they've done to move the city forward. I'm Dr. Rosa Bell. I'm a board certified neurologist, epileptologist, and clinical neurophysiologist. Uh, one of the things that I have great interest in is concussion and brain trauma. I have a patent published technology where I assess concussions objectively and I think that this is going to help tremendously, especially in contact sports and persons with traumatic brain injury. I really feel as though my work that I do in neurology is going to save a lot of lives and I want others, particularly young African American women, to see that if you have that desire and put toward the work and don't give up, you can accomplish any goal. Nothing is impossible. The word itself says, I'm possible. Stay away from negative energy and that 10% of life is what happens to you, 90% is how you react to it. I'm Fred Gray. I was born in Montgomery, Alabama, on December the 14th, 19. 30. When I saw the problems that we were having on the buses in Montgomery, and my mother had already uh, told the five of us that we could be whatever we want to be, and when I saw what Mr. Nixon was trying to do, and how he was doing everything he could to bring about equality for African Americans. So that encouraged me to try to join him in doing what I could do to help solve the problems that we had. And that motivated me, plus what my mother had told me, plus my religious faith, all contributed toward me becoming a civil rights lawyer and doing what I could to destroy segregation. 
My name is Katherine Coleman Flowers. I'm the Rural Development Manager for the Equal Justice Initiative, and I'm also the founder of the Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice. One of the things that I like for others to see in me is that I like the fact that I'm from the country. There's some certain values that we get in rural America that I think that are exemplary of what it means to be neighborly. My passion to work with others came from my parents, who were also passionate about helping people in our community, uh, our neighbors, our family, our friends. Since I've become a parent, I'm influenced by uh, trying to leave a legacy for my child and my grandchild. And I'm really trying to make sure that I leave behind a better world for him and seven generations to come. I think that we should all apply the golden rule and do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Thanks for watching this Alabama News Network special, Making History Today. Montgomery has been a big part of the journey toward justice and equality, and we'll be watching how our city plays a role in the years to come. For all of us at Alabama News Network, I'm Jerome Jones. See you again soon. This has been a special presentation from Alabama News Network. Making History Today, brought to you by Alpha Insurance.